He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And now there's joy that floods my soul. Hi, dear ones. Pastor Dan here. You know, I love to share that little bit, of course. There's a whole lot more to it. It goes on to say, something wonderful happened when he touched me. He made me complete. He makes you complete in Christ, in God. When he comes into your life, he makes you whole. I just love that Gaither, that Gaither course because that particular course is a salvation course. And dear ones, it's also shared with you as a reminder that all this world can give you sometimes is happiness, a few laughters, but it can also take it away. But the joy that we speak of in this little chorus, the world can't touch, no circumstances can't touch, no government can take away. It is the joy of the Lord, and only He can give it to you. So there it is, dear ones, and I hope as we continue in our study today that you will avail yourself of that joy. Now, you may recall, by the way, you know, if, if you're joining us for the first time, did you know we gather together around God's holy and infallible word? I believe that this is the only word of absolute truth going out into the former United States of America today and, and for that matter, any other country from the very top to the very bottom. But dear ones, if today as we continue our study, if you're blessed, challenged, uplifted in any way, then I would encourage you to subscribe. Because in that way, you're always going to know when we're having a new study. And also, you can also go back and review some of the older studies. But while you're there, why not share? Why not, why not invite a friend, a family member, maybe even a former friend, because you just don't know. Because you cared and dared enough to reach out with the love of God, that former friendship just might be rekindled around the Word of God. So now, dear ones, as we continue in that word, I invite you to open your Bibles because you know by now <laughs> we go verse by verse so everything that we do. So you might recall that in our last study, we're in chapter 13. We're going to conclude that chapter 13 today and possibly even go into a couple of verses in chapter 6. But in our last study, we followed Jesus through verses 13 to 30 of chapter 13. Now, most significantly, we noted that, that the one who was betraying Jesus actually received bread from him. In fact, Jesus quoted Psalms 41 and 9, where it's prophesied, He who eats bread with me has lifted his heel against me. Now in so doing, Jesus was saying that the one who fellowship with him, the one that he counted as a friend, would actually turn against him. When Jesus finally said in that night, One of you will betray me, eleven of the twelve disciples were just they're deeply perplexed, and they asked, Lord, is it I? And then finally, Judas asked, Rabbi, is it I? To which Jesus quietly said to him, You have said it. And then we also noted in that last study that in, in setting Judas to his immediate left, Jesus gave him a place of honor. Even giving him that piece of bread dipped in herbal sauce was a gesture of friendship. And so it was love that reached out to Judas, giving him one last chance to change his course of action. But once he took that bread from Jesus' hand and ate it, if indeed he did, Satan entered him, and there was no turning back. And so Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly, or as the Greek has it, do faster. Now, our text told us in our last study in verse 30 that it was night. And so Judas departed into the darkness. Good representation, the darkness of his soul. And he assumed his place in history. And as he left, Jesus would again break bread. But at this time it served a different purpose. With the bread and the cup, he instituted what we have come to call the Lord's Supper. And so that brings us to our text for today, verse 31. With Jesus continuing on to say, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. Now, someone might ask, well, at this point, how, how is God being glorified in Jesus? Well, you might consider the cross. You might consider the crucifixion. From the human side, the cross looks like shame, looks like, looks like defeat. But God was glorified in, in him because the salvation of the world was accomplished 
through the cross. Everything had been set in motion. Jesus' loving and willing obedience to the Father's cause was demonstrated in what he said to Judas, what you do, do quickly. Even, even in that moment, the Son of, of Man was glorified. And due to the infinite closeness between God, the sender, and Jesus, the one sent, God was glorified in him. The two are inseparable. When we think about, about Christ's suffering, it's hard to know what to admire most, whether it be the voluntary self-surrender of the Son of God to such a death for sinners such as we, or the willingness of the Father to give him up for that cause. Scripture tells us that God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus goes on to say in verse 32, If God be glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Now that word if in no way uh, it puts it into question. It's, just, it's, it's a statement. It's like saying this is what happens as verse 31 is fulfilled. Not only is God glorified in the process, but the Son is glorified in the Father's glorification. And that glorification was immediate. And Jesus goes on to say in verse 33, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you. This is the only place in this gospel where Jesus addresses his disciples with this endearment. John, he, he would remember it, use it in his epistles. With Judas gone, these eleven were now Christ's little children. The point is, shortly Jesus is going to the cross, and, and no one can go to the cross as he did. He suffered alone, and there, in his suffering, Christ, which you and I can never fully understand, he endured suffering. The phrase, where I am going, you cannot come, was said to the Jewish leaders back in chapter 7 and chapter 8. Now, though the disciples would no longer be able to enjoy Jesus' physical presence, they would, as we can, rejoice in a renewed, deeper, lasting fellowship with him. He was with them. But he said he will now be in them through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so now, dear ones, we can have Christ in us through that same dear and indwelling Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Christ. And even while they would no longer have that physical fellowship to enjoy with Jesus, they would, as we should, be able to enjoy one another's fellowship. And hence Jesus continued to say in verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. In Deuteronomy 6 and 5, we're told, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And this, of course, is the Jewish Shema, wherein we are to love God completely. And then in Leviticus 19, 18, we're told, as Jesus later repeated, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so the commandment to love was not new. However, as a person of the word, you, you, you should note that Jesus' command to love presented with it a distinctly new standard for two reasons. First, it was a sacrificial love, modeled after his love. Hence, he said, as I have loved you. And secondly, it is produced and made possible through the transforming power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. It is, as we're told in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love. The importance of living and openly demonstrating such love is given by Jesus in verse 35. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Then that phrase, by this, it carries the meaning of by this alone. Unbelievers still recognize Jesus' disciples, not by their doctrinal distinctives, not by their uh, dramatic miracles, or even by their professed love for the lost, but by their deeds of love for one another. And so the question arises, do you have and do you demonstrate that love in your life? It has been said, the church that hopes to win the lost must pay the one unchanging cost. She must compel the world to see in her the Christ of Calvary. And so it remains love, not fundamental faith, 
that transforms an individual. And in that individual, a church, it is as we're told in Galatians 5, if you abide and devour one another, careful, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. You don't want to be a Christian cannibal. Be one of love, that others may know that Christ lives, that so for they can see his love in your life. And hopefully, hopefully you remember that in verse 33, Jesus said, where I'm going, you cannot come. Now here in verse 36, we see Peter refer back to that statement. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Peter's question had already been addressed by Jesus. And so here it indicates that he completely, he completely missed the point of what Jesus said in verses 34 and 35. Peter did not want Jesus to leave them. And that's where his mind was at this moment. And so Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. So here in verse 36, Jesus repeats what he said in verse 33, but by adding, you shall follow me afterward. He was predicting that Peter would indeed later follow him in crucifixion. And this can only mean that his first statement, Jesus was speaking of his own crucifixion, through which he would afterwards be returning to the Father who sent him. Peter, he still did not grasp Jesus' meaning. And being thus blissfully unaware of his own weakness, we see Peter say in verse 37, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Words, you know, are often easier said than fulfilled. God, good intentions are not always sufficient. At this point, Peter felt that he was ready to die for Jesus, but unfortunately, he was not ready to live for him. And that's the bottom line. If one cannot live for him, he will never die for him. And the only way we can ever truly live for him is to die to self. It is as Paul said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And we will later see Peter was ready to attack single-handed a group of temple guards with his little sword. He even cut off one of the guards' ears. But earlier, he was not willing to wash the feet of his brothers as Jesus had just done. In reality, Peter, P Peter had things backwards. Peter was willing to lay down his life for Jesus. But Jesus was about to lay his life down for Peter. Peter's time would come when he would indeed die for his Lord. And feeling unworthy to be crucified in the manner Jesus was, he would request to be crucified upside down. And so Jesus goes on to answer Peter in verse 38, will you, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly I say to you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times should be understood that unlike Judas, Peter's problem was not with Satan, but with overconfidence in the flesh. You never want to forget that back in chapter 6, when it comes to spiritual matters, Jesus said the flesh profits nothing. In Galatians 5.17, we're told that the flesh is at odds with the Holy Spirit. It can be said he's even at odds with your own spirit once you're born again. Jesus' reputation repetition in question form of Peter's exact words was it was not meant as a mockery. It, it, it highlights the irony of Peter's words and sets the stage for his threefold denial. Now the casual reader will overlook it, but you as a person of the word should know that at this point it was indeed late into the night. And what Jesus had said of Peter, what Jesus had said of Peter would only be a matter of a few hours away what was called the third watch of the night. To be more precise, Jesus was telling Peter that before 3 a.m. in the morning, he would deny him three times. Now, you know, the rooster always crowed at this time. And while hardly noticed by those around him, Peter would distinctly hear it. Peter would remember the sound. And Peter would remember the look of Jesus as he turned and looked at him. 
Jesus' remark had to be a, a, a stunning res response to, G to Peter's declaration of, of loyalty. In fact, we will see that Peter was so stunned. He was so stunned that he had nothing more to say. In fact, he's not even mentioned again until chapter 18. Verse 38, there was ends chapter 13. But it does not end the upper room discourse. And so we see in chapter 14, Jesus goes on to say in verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And this translation can be a little misleading. In fact, there are those who believe at this point Jesus is still talking directly to Peter. But most translations have it as hearts. Let not your hearts be troubled. With Jesus addressing the whole group. And this would reflect the plural of the Greek. Personally, I, I tend to lean in that direction. But in reality, it's a non-issue as the message is the same either way. It's interesting to know that then instead of the disciples lending support to Jesus in the hours before his crucifixion, he had to support them spiritually as well as emotionally. And through the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit, dear ones, he still renders that support to you. Yes, Jesus knew. Jesus knew that this little band of disciples could and would be shaken, fearful, not only of his words concerning his departure, but also by the fact that he would soon become their crucified lamb. And with that in mind, he tells them not to let their hearts be troubled or more accurately overcome with turmoil and fear. And he tells them as he does us how that is possible, regardless of the debauchery that you see unfolding in your society. Today, Jesus says, you believe in God, believe also in me. Now that word believe is the key because in the Greek it is trust. In time of trouble when your heart is fearful, Jesus calls us, Jesus calls you to trust in him. And as we're told in Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will, dear ones, direct your paths. And so we see that Jesus calls us to place our trust not in the powers, not in the authorities, not in the government's evidence in the world, but in God and in himself. And such a directive is yet another clear implication that Jesus Christ is himself God. And he says in verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And in the Greek, the word mansions is monai. Mone, with the meaning of abiding places. And according to the context, Jesus was continuing to comfort the disciples who dreaded to think of the coming separation. It was with this in mind that he assured them that life, that his going away to the Father's house had its purpose of reunion. It was not a, a, a permanent separation in their life. In the place where he was going, there was room for them as well. In fact, he's going away would make his this reunion possible. And so that what, what, that what appeared to be a disaster to them was in reality a blessing. Apart from Christ's death and the work of the Holy Spirit, there would have been no place in heaven for the disciples, or for that matter, dear ones, even for you. That clause, if it were not so, I would have told you, has the meaning that if it were not so, he, he certainly would have known all about it. And he would have told them that because it's true, by means of his suffering, by means of his exaltation, he goes ahead to prepare a place for them and ultimately for you. The fact is, without his sacrificial death, there would be no place for you. And without his ascension and his sending forth the Holy Spirit, we would not, for we could not be made ready for the place his sacrifice has made possible for us, for you. And thus we see in verse 3 that Jesus goes on to say, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And that is a powerful truth. It is the fulfillment of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now as a person of the word, you want to know that this is the first time in the Bible where you find a mention of God 
taking anyone off this planet, off this earth, to go to a place that he has prepared for them. And you may be sure that I'm aware of the Old Testament saints that were taken, but it does not state or imply to a place that was particularly prepared for them. This is definitely not the hope of the Old Testament saints. This is the hope of the born-again Christian. This is your hope, or it could be, and it should be. God never promised Abraham to take him off to some distant galaxy or star. God did not tell him he would make his offspring, I should say God did tell him, he would make his offspring as numerous as the stars and give them, give them an eternal home here on this earth called the promised land. And dear one, it's the very same land that Satan's demons are trying to claim for themselves today. And other governments want to divide up. But no government, dear ones, can ever take or divide up into two states what God has given to Israel. The disciples would have been startled when Jesus revealed that he was going to take a people, beginning with them, off this earth to be with him in the place that he was preparing for them. And when Jesus said to receive you to myself, it was like saying to welcome you to be face to face with me face to face with me once again. And so wonderful, so wonderful is Christ's love for you that, listen dear ones, he's not satisfied with the idea of just merely bringing you to heaven. He wants to bring heaven to you, to bring you into his embrace. You know, during the, the war with Japan, the Second World War, when the late General Douglas MacArthur had to leave the Philippines, he said, I will return. Many believed. And many waited, as you should, for Christ's return. And the promise was well kept, as his will be kept. And the world saw it and the news. How much more so the promise of the Son of God, I will come again and receive you unto myself. What you need to know is that this event speaks of the rapture of the church, as mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus shall we always be with the Lord. And this is the event of verse 3. Jesus goes on to say in verse 4, And where I go you know, and the way you know. So as presented here, this, this verse is a little misleading, as the Greek does not show Christ presenting two statements. Most translations more accurately say, to the place where I am going, you know the way. And so we see Thomas say to Jesus in verse 5, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Now in today's vernacular, it would be like the youngest person in a group saying, we don't even know where you're going, much less the way. And to this, Jesus would still say as he does in our concluding statement, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the sixth of the, re of the seven I am statements of Jesus in John's Gospel. Here in response to Thomas, Jesus declared to him as he does to us today that he is the way to God. Common English tells you that that word the means exclusive, the only way. He is the way to God because he is the truth of God. He's the way to God because he is the life of God. In this verse, the exclusiveness of Jesus as the only approach to the Father is emphatic. Only one way, not many ways exist to God. And that way is Jesus Christ. You can deny it. <laughs> but dear one, you will not change it. This, as I said, will be our last verse for today. There are four major truths in this one verse, all of which are pertinent to your faith. And so in our next study, we'll pick this verse up again and look maybe a little bit deeper into it. But for now, I leave you to ponder, is Jesus Christ the truth of your life? Is he? your life. He can be. He should be.
Let us pray. Father God, once again, we thank you for your word. For your word alone is truth. Your word alone is a living word. And it goes out to your people throughout this land who are looking for peace, who are looking for a better life in a life of turmoil, in a country in turmoil, upside down, where things that were good are now called evil, where, where darkness is now called light. Dear ones, if you're kind of caught up in that world, you, you don't know which way to turn. There's only one way to turn. And Jesus said, I am that way. For I am the truth and I am the life. And dear ones, if you're out there today, you would like to make the decision to invite Jesus Christ into your life, to be your Lord, to be your Savior, then I simply invite you to join with me, dear ones, in this simple little prayer. Father God, thank you for forgiving me of my sins. I know I'm a sinner, but I am a sinner saved by grace, your grace. And so now I invite you, as I open my heart to you, to come into my life, be the Lord of my life, be the Savior of my life. And as I open my heart to you, I know that now you, through the precious Holy Spirit, indwell my life. You are inside of me. And so I promise, as you impart that life to me, as you impart your love to me, I will, as you lead me and help me, share that love and that life with others. I now am born again. I am your child, and you are my Lord and my Savior. Amen. And dear friends, if that was your prayer today, then I would encourage you to, to remember that God has made a promise to you, and that promise will be yours for a lifetime. You can see it for yourself in Revelation 3.20, where Jesus says, Behold, or literally, listen, I stand at the door and knock, and from a spiritual perspective, that's the door of your heart. If any man, if any person hear that voice and opens that door as only you can, because it can only be opened from the inside, here comes the promise. I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. And that, dear one, speaks of an everlasting fellowship that just, it just gets sweeter as the days go by, and I'm here to tell you, even as the years go by, and you engage yourself in the fellowship of prayer and the, and the reading of God's holy word and the communion of, of a church standing behind the, the apostles' doctrine and, the, and, in, and in fellowship and the breaking of bread and, of course, in prayer. Dear ones, we will continue following Jesus next in chapter 14. I invite you to join us at that point. But until then, dear ones, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord grant you his peace and give you his favor. So until we come again together around God's word, remember, I believe that God has something special for us. But until then, God bless and bye-bye.